All right, my Q&A crowd. Hey, thank you for sticking around and thanks to you who are in the future watching this online. I hope it's still sunny outside when you're watching this. Uh, let's dive right in because I got a lot of questions and by all means, feel free to text in follow-ups. Uh, today was the day I expected might go a bit longer on the Q&A. We certainly have more questions than usual. And let me restate the ground rules. T two things I want to make you aware of. Um, if you hear an answer you like, um, I want to ask you to not amen it in here because we're going to be talking about sensitive stuff that maybe it just hits someone else differently. And as much as you want to be encouraging and that's a great heart, it might not encourage them. And the same goes for if you hear an answer you do not like, send me the email, grab me after, don't do it in here, please, would be my ask. Um, additionally, I also want to say if you hear the question that interests you answered and you're like, this is still going, uh, you are welcome to peace out at any time. No one will look at you funny. We're just super glad that you're here for extra innings already. So um, with that said, let me pray for us and then we will dive in. Uh, Jesus, I am keenly aware that where words are many transgression is not lacking and so I ask that you would control my tongue, that you would give me your wisdom and thoughts, and that you would, um, don't let me operate out of fear of not saying something, but I pray that you just take control over me and let me be your temple, and that you could speak your wisdom through me. If you can do it through a donkey, you could do it through me. And so come in power um, to help us. We all want to walk with you. And so would you help us to that end, in your beautiful name I ask, amen. All right, let's dive right in. So like I said, more questions than usual, and you can still text and follow-ups at any time. We'll just start with this. Number one, when some use the term gay, they mean someone attracted to people of the same sex, while others mean more. Some use the term gay as an identity, and there is a sliding scale to this, but it is beyond just a description of their orientation. With this in mind, would you say using the term gay Christian, sorry, let me read that better. Would you say using the term gay Christian is wise since it has varying definitions within our culture? Can you support your scription, uh, position scripturally? That is a very good question with a lot of parts. Let me try to take them one at a time. So uh, number one question asker says, hey, when some people use the term gay, they mean it this way. When others say it, uh, they mean it this way. This is not unique to the word gay. This is how language works. So I had a seminary professor when he's teaching us about Bible interpretation, he put bark on the board and he said, what does this mean? And I'm thinking rough, rough, because I love dogs and I want to have a dog someday. We'll see. And um, others are thinking trees because they're more outdoorsy than me. The same word can have a variety of meanings. And so here's how language works. Language has to be relational where words have meanings, but there's also many meanings words can have. Again, you can't make bark say constitution. That's like not within the semantic range, but within the semantic range, you have to get to know one another. So yes, totally agree with that question asker. Some use it to describe their orientation. Some mean more. Um, here's where terms get really, really tricky. It says some use the term gay as identity. I wanna come back to that because the word identity has a range of semantic meaning, but put that aside for a moment. Um, the way, the way I would say it is someone they say, I am gay, like a, a David Bennett, when he describes himself as a gay celibate Christian, what he means, and he says this in his book, is he means I have only experienced sexual feelings towards men, that I am attracted to the same sex. Other people, when they say I am gay, they mean I am um, living a gay lifestyle. I am um, having sex with someone of the same sex. Um, and then, I mean, if you really wanted to be argumentative, someone could say, I just mean I'm happy, but I would say like, you're from a time machine, people don't use the word that way anymore. But those are maybe the two main ways people use it, is some use it to refer to an orientation, um, others would use it to refer to uh, a lifestyle and how they are choosing to live their life. Um, I would say we should recognize that statement as true. Um, the reason I say that is because I've talked to so many people over the last few weeks. I don't know a lot of people who use the word gay to mean I'm having gay sex. But I've talked to people that that's how the people in their lives would use the term gay. So I want to recognize some use it that way. 
most people I know, again, I'm just one data point. When they say I'm gay, they're talking about their orientation. But yes, there is a range of meanings somewhere from orientation to how you're living your life. Given that there's a range of meanings, uh, is it wise for a term a Christian to use the term, or for someone to use the term gay Christian? Here's what I would say. If you mean your orientation, I would say it is permissible biblically to use the term gay Christian if all you mean is you're describing your orientation. Now, is it wise is another question. We saw this last week in Corinthians. Technically, there's things you're allowed to do, not a good idea. Is it morally permissible to eat a Tide Pod? Yes. Is it wise? Probably not, unless you're a dishwasher. And so what I would say is, in a narrow set of circumstances, I would say it is biblically permissible and possibly wise. Let me come back to that and say, there are certain circumstances, if you mean gay lifestyle, if you mean I am in a same-sex marriage, that's what you mean when you say gay, I would say it is not a good idea for a Christian to use that term because that puts you in opposition with the teaching of Jesus. And I don't think it's ever good to put ourselves in opposition to the teaching of Jesus. It's like if I say I am a Dodgers fan, that is an identity statement. So someone says, someone uses it as a term of identity. I'm like, well, sometimes identity is kind of inconsequential to your life. Other times it's overriding. If I say I'm a Dodgers fan, technically you could do that. Now you might say, I don't think that's a wise choice. The Giants are better. You should not use that. But um, that is a way of saying, hey, it's permissible. We've got to talk about the wisdom of it. But if you say, um, like, I don't believe in the Trinity, I am a modalist, someone that denies that God is three persons. I am a modalist Christian. That term makes no sense because you're opposing the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. So to go back to question asker, if by gay we mean I am living a lifestyle in opposition to the teaching of Jesus, I don't think we should use the term. If by gay you are describing your orientation, I think we need to think about what is wise for the moment for the person. And the pastor that I think has the most wisdom on this, and he's thought about it a lot more than me, is a man named Sam Alberry. Sam would describe himself as a same-sex attracted Christian. Uh, he is a pastor, actually, in Nashville. Godly dude, loves Jesus, has written some great books that have helped me out a lot. And what he says is, I don't tend to use the term gay Christian for myself because in our culture, gay tends to have lots wrapped up with it that I don't mean. Kind of like question askers asking, like he sees gay over here. But what he says is, if I'm talking to non-Christians, there are times where I will use the term gay to describe myself, not because that's how I think of myself, but because a non-Christian doesn't understand a made-up word like same-sex attraction. That's kind of Christianese. And so what Sam would say is, it's permissible, it's not always wise, and out of love for Jesus, you should decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, for Sam, he typically, among Christians, we call him same-sex attracted. When he's among non-Christians, he will use the term gay, a lot like the Apostle Paul, who says, I will become all things to all people. He doesn't mean I will become sinning, but he means within the range of what's acceptable, I'll become all things to all people. And to the question of can I support all of this biblically? Because it's really nice to hear what Sam Albury thinks. And if you Google him, he has a British accent, so everything sounds so smart. It's nice to hear what Sam thinks. It's nice to hear what Chad thinks. What does Jesus think? In the Bible, you will see uh, the term Gentiles used all over the place. Gentiles, and it's funny, it's also a G word, is a word that has a semantic range of meaning either someone who is born of an ethnic nation outside of Israel, totally morally neutral, or Gentiles can also mean um, a lifestyle of um, indulging in sexual immorality and lust and injustice. This is why when scripture says, don't be like the Gentiles and the passions of their lust, that's using this definition over here. But at other times, the Bible will say, and the Gentiles rejoiced. The believers rejoiced. They talk about Gentile believers. And so I would say that's biblical evidence to say we need to get beyond words are bad or good and understand what is being meant by the word. And where a bad thing is being meant, we should not use it. Where a good thing is being meant, that someone from this people group is meeting Jesus— I think we need to at least have a category that missionally to reach people for Jesus, there can be use for it. That's certainly how the Apostle Paul treated the word Gentile. He used it both positively 
to talk about Christians and negatively to talk about a lifestyle. And I would submit to you, our word gay is not that far off. We want to submit to Jesus. If we're not submitting to Jesus, we shouldn't be using it. If we are, I think we need to think there are cases in which it would be helpful, in which it wouldn't, and love is always the guide when we're walking in the teaching of Jesus to discern the difference. That's what I would say um, on that front. Send in a follow-up question. If you got it, I'm going to keep moving. Number two, Chad, you referenced the shadow a couple of times in the sermon. Oh, I'm not familiar with uh, what you mean by that phrase. Can you please explain? So, um, yes, I can. Uh, And to honor my wife, this is a concept. It comes from the Bible. I'll show it to you. But I want to tell you, my wife, who is a great Bible teacher, taught me this. Um, Paul will often talk about, um, well, let me just read it to you. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the Mosaic law and honoring certain days. And what he says about the Mosaic law is it was a shadow that was cast by Jesus Christ. And now that the form has come, like the one casting the shadow, we don't need the shadow anymore is how Paul will use it. Let me read it to you. This is in Colossians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath. Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments. And and he's like, the whole Mosaic law was just, it was like a shadow that Jesus was casting. His form was the one that was always telling us we're meant to rest because he is the God in who we rest. But now that the form has come, don't obsess over the shadow. Get your eyes up on the form. Um, Sorry, I should keep reading Bible here. He says, verse 17, this is the verse. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That right there is where the concept comes from. Karen, when I met her, had a blog called Substance Over Shadows, where she talked about every good gift in our life is a shadow of what we're looking for in God. And this is what James, I believe, is chapter 1 says, that every good gift in this world comes down from the Father of lights, from whom all good gifts flow. That's what's meant by the language of shadow, that if you've ever had um, a good drink and it wasn't sinful, if you've ever had good and it wasn't sinful, like you overburnt it, like you cooked your meat properly, that is a shadow of something you were meant to enjoy that's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. And like Paul says in, Roman, or in Colossians 2.17, these shadows are good, but the one who is the form casting the shadow has come. And this is where C.S. Lewis talks, let's move out of the shadow lands where we're obsessing over the shadows. And is it Plato that has the cave of where you see the shadows? And he's like, let's go out of the shadow land and into the substance, which is Christ. So when I say something's a shadow, I'm just saying, hey, that's good, but you ultimately want Jesus. And marriage would be a prime example where, hey, marriage is good, but the good you're reaching for there is ultimately coming from Jesus. And if you have a marriage, but you don't have Jesus, you have gained ultimately in the long run in terms of what you're looking for and nothing. That's what it means, substance over shadows. It doesn't mean that the shadows aren't bad. Um, And actually, Paul encourages us to rest like the Sabbath would say. It just means Christ is better, and let's focus on Jesus as we seek to enjoy the shadows. So shout out to Karen. I don't know if that blog's still on the internet, but it was really good. She would talk about, hey, I saw a shadow of Jesus in this TV show. And she would pull out, here's how you can, um, it's almost a great way to worship. I will just close by saying that on that question. That when you have a lens for that every good gift in this world comes down from above, then wherever I see something good, that is ultimately a shadow cast by Christ's goodness. It's kind of like, who's the philosopher that says all truth is God's truth? This is kind of like a a Karen way or a Pauline way of saying that. It's a shadow cast by him. And so let's enjoy the shadow and celebrate the substance. Okay, Uh, next question. I think this is number three. If our main focus should be on drawing people into the love of Jesus, not calling out their sin, how do we balance, number one, calling others to holiness with, number two, the simple call to come to Jesus and leaving the transformation into holiness to his spirit within them? How does this look different in our relationships with unbelievers as well as those within the church? Let me start by saying this is a very good question, and the way we answer this probably is a philosophy of ministry question. What I mean by that is Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians might give you different answers here. Let me me paint the boundaries kind of like if you're bowling and you have the bumpers up. Here's the bumpers, and you don't want to stray outside of this. 
Scripture clearly calls us um, to speak into the lives of other believers. Uh, I believe it's the book of Hebrews. If anyone knows the reference, shout it out, where he says, hey, let us exhort one another every day as long as it's called today so that we won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I promise, okay, let's look it up. This is why I bring my computer. Uh, Hebrews, let us exhort one another. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, Let us exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that we might not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So scripture absolutely calls brothers and sisters in Christ who have relationship with one another to speak into one another's lives. Um, and so if you're not doing that, uh, the, the way uh, Jesus would say it is, if you uh, uh, see sin in your brother's life and say nothing, how much do you have to hate them to not tell them about that thing in their life? And so um, one bumper over here should be, we cannot be silent when someone is sinning because sin is, it can harden us, it can deceive us. And the, the book of Hebrews has strong warnings. If you uh, persist in unrepentant sin, you might show yourself to be outside of the faith. Doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. It's saying you have got to test yourself. And so one bumper should be Christians should be speaking into the life of other Christians. And in some cult church cultures, we stink at that and need to be told it's time to speak up. I was in a church one time where there were um, two folks who were uh, living together in covenant membership in the church. And I said, are we going to talk to them about that? And they said, well, we don't know if they're sleeping together. They're just living together. Young couple, prime of life. And I'm like, yeah. Okay, I guess we could ask the questions. I do tend to jump to conclusions. But yeah, I talked to them, a lovely couple. They were really honest that like, hey, you know, we are basically living as married, but our parents got divorced and we just, we don't want to get divorced. So we're trying to take our time with this. So then I went to the, and I was brand new at this church. And I was like, guys, we now know. What are we going to do about it? And what was said to me is, we're going to let the Holy Spirit convict them in time. Now, let me say, when we get over here, there's such a thing as being uh, too in the face of other people, and you want to guard against that, and that's my error, by the way. But there's such a thing as being a coward and trying to baptize that. And that's what I think was going on in this church. They didn't want to have a hard conversation, so they wanted to leave it up to the Holy Spirit. I would say one bumper, and again, work it out with the Spirit in conversation, but one bumper should be, it is our job to speak into the lives of other believers. And what I told this church was, Romans 10, how are they going to know if no one will open their mouth and speak? So, okay, that's one bumper. It's our job to speak into the lives of other believers. You know the story of Cain and Abel where Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? He's not the good guy in that story. I don't know if you know this. God's saying, yes, you are his keeper. It is your job. Okay, so, but then on the other side, Jesus is going to say, why are you so concerned about the sin in someone else's life, like the speck of dust in their eye when you have a two by four hanging out of your own eye? And so sometimes Jesus is going to say, why don't you before, this is the key part, he says, before you address sin in their life, address the sin in your own life. And so the other bumper needs to become, we shouldn't be so focused on the sins of others, we don't see sin in our own life. And I think one of the ways we can avoid dealing with sin in our own life is by focusing on sin in the lives of others. Or um, to say it nicer, like I'm so type A, if I see a problem in one of my kids' life, I'm like, I've got to fix it. Whereas if you try to fix every, so let me change principles now. If you try to fix every problem instantly, you will crush your children. This is what scripture says, do not exasperate your children. And God is this way with us, where if he were to tell me everything in my life that needs to change right now, I would be crushed and never get off the floor. The Holy Spirit is gracious and kind to point to one thing at a time and give me grace to work it out. I will say in this book, um, A War of Loves, David Bennett meets Jesus. He starts off going, well, if Jesus loves me, he must be cool with me getting married to a guy. And so he starts pursuing that. And it takes him a process of years to come to understand what Jesus is saying. I was reading this book, and I'll be really honest with you. I didn't have this bumper up, and I thought if I was involved in David's life at that time, I might have pushed him too hard, too fast to accept what the Bible says, instead of giving him room to stumble forward together. Again, it doesn't mean you're silent. It just means sometimes we try to get someone totally sanctified in an instant when sanctification takes time. So to summarize, our two bumpers are, it is our job to speak into the lives of other Christians. The other bumper is, 
It is not our job to be the Holy Spirit, and we can't fix everyone overnight, and we need to be patient with them as Jesus is patient with us. Within those bumpers, I think there's great freedom for how to figure that out. Um, and I would say ask a wise other Christian, like, hey, am I, am I riding this person too hard? I would also say know your biases. My bias is to ride people too hard in discipleship. And um, for me, I will disciple better when I learn to take a breath and breathe and not correct every issue. I have friends that their bias is to say nothing, and they will do well to learn to grow a backbone and to speak up and to say something. We all need to know our proclivities so that we can seek to find balance. The last thing I will simply say is on all of this, because this whole question started off by talking about non-Christians. I've been talking about Christians this whole time. I don't know if you noticed that. To talk to non-Christians, I would say we have no business telling non-Christians how to live their lives. Like, honestly, and maybe, maybe this is philosophy of ministry, but no, I think this is biblical, where God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world. Like, it is not our job to critique non-Christians for acting like non-Christians. It's our job to tell non-Christians how great Jesus is so that they will become a Christian. And then once they do, then we can have the discipleship conversations. And so when I'm talking to LGBTQI folks, I'm not even thinking of talking to them about their sexuality. I just want to tell them about Jesus. Once we clear the bar of faith that they believe in Jesus, then I want to talk about what Jesus has said in his word. But until then, if they don't love Jesus, why would they trust the things Jesus said that sounds so very hard? Um, so, so that's what I would say to that. Um, the Lord's bringing to mind, Jesus also does say count the cost. So you don't want to like dupe someone into following Jesus. So I think we, we probably do need to find a way that people know what we believe about this stuff. But I do think, again, maybe it's my personal error is to drive things into the ground. So I'm just learning to take a breath and be like, we're going to talk about Jesus. And once you love Jesus, we'll talk about the rest. And again, reading this book encouraged me to do that because he was still believing that same-sex marriage was okay when he met Jesus. He was still believing that a year later. It was a journey and it took time. So that would be my um, remember your bumpers, know your proclivities. And then again, our goal is not to make moral people and that are going to hell. Our goal is to help people meet Jesus and get them on a path towards heaven and then help them work out discipleship. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is I think apart from knowing the love of God in Christ, the law kills. Scripture says this, the, the law kills. It condemns. And so it really seems inappropriate to me that we would try to teach the law and God's commands to someone that doesn't know the love of God and have his spirit coursing through their veins to help them obey what the law says. Let's give them the gospel first, and then we'll help them walk in Jesus's way would be the way I would um, say it. Um, the thing I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to say again is just know your proclivities. If you are not like me and you need the courage to speak up and say something, hear that. If you are like me and you tend to drive issues into the ground, learn with me to take a breath and God will help us work it out. Okay, next question. I forget what number we're on, maybe four, maybe five, God knows. With all of this new information in mind, how do we interpret Leviticus 18 verse 12? I apologize if you had already answered this in a previous sermon. No sweat, I have not answered this. Let us see here. Leviticus 18.12 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Um, several responses I would have to that. I would say that fits within the sexual ethic of Jesus that we've been talking about because we said marriage is, or excuse me, sex, lying with is a euphemism for sex there. So it's saying you shall not have sex with a male as with a woman. So this is saying a, a man should not have sex with a man as if it were a woman. This is saying you shall not commit acts of homosexual sex. That's what that text is saying. Um, this is an abomination before the Lord. I would say that really sounds a lot like Romans 1, where Paul says when uh, a man has sex with another man or a woman has sex with another woman, it is against nature. I think that's similar to the term abomination. That, man, this is, it grieves the heart of God. It hurts his world. It hurts his people. God doesn't like this. I, I would say it's very much the same, that it grieves God's heart when we say, God, I know better than you. I'm going to do it this way. So, yeah, I do think that uh, 
when uh, a man has sex with another man, it grieves the heart of God. Um, just like Romans chapter 1 says. Um, I would also be quick to add, you know what else grieves God's heart? Keep reading the list. Gossip, slander, not obeying your parents. And so, I, again, because I know how offensive a Leviticus 18.22 sounds in our culture, and what we have to remind people in our culture is, man, first of all, this is Mosaic code, so we, we follow the law of Christ, which isn't in opposition with Leviticus, but there, Leviticus is a shadow, we follow the substance. Jesus has been very clear on us on our sexual ethics, so we're not riding on Leviticus here. But there's, th this is the critique you'll hear. Is Leviticus says it's an abomination to have different kinds of fabric in your shirt. And it's an abomination to eat shellfish. And I was like, well, I don't like shellfish anyway, so let's call it an abomination. I'm just kidding. But um, the response I always have there is, yes, God's law to Israel was to teach them to be a holy set-apart people. Some of that was moral. Some of that was ceremonial. And there's not clean lines to know what was unique to Israel under the old covenant, what's for us under the new covenant, the best line to know is if a command is repeated by Jesus or his apostles in the New Testament, you know for sure that one is for us. And if one of Jesus or his apostles say that command in Moses is not for you, you know for sure that's not for you. And I'm telling you, that is like 99% of Mosaic law right there. So when Jesus declares all food clean, he's saying, go for the shellfish, which I'm like, no, thank you, Lord, but thank you for the permission. Um, when Jesus says, hey, haven't you read in the beginning, the creator made them male and female, that's what marriage is, so don't mess with it. We take Leviticus 18 as having wisdom for us, but ultimately it's Jesus' word that's authoritative. So that's how I would interpret that. And again, I think the word, um, I would say, I wouldn't lead with this when I'm evangelizing my non-Christian friends because abomination, um, words like that, I think get used out of context where we don't teach that lying, um, God says, I hate lying lips. Um, God also says, I hate divorce. We don't tend to lead with that stuff um, because so much of us have that in our story. But for some reason, we zoom in on this community and want to highlight certain words. And so we just say, it's true. It's God's word. We just have to recognize that God is so holy that anything that isn't perfect is going to be, in human terms, an abomination to him. And he doesn't tell us that to crush us. He tells us that to say, come and let me wash you and make you clean so that you can be whole on the other side. So that's what I would say to Leviticus chapter 18. Um, let's see, da-da-da-da-da-da. Next question. If there will still be gender in heaven, then what will be of trans people? That, whew, that is a good question. Um, it depends on what you mean by trans people. And I'm glad this came up because I actually want to amend an answer I gave in the first week Q&A. So in the first week Q&A, someone asked, we talk a lot about male and female, but what about people that are born um, uh, uh, intersex? And what I said is, Abigail Favalli, I'm going to do it all four weeks, you should read this book. In here, she goes through the science of gender. And at a scientific level, like at a pure, hard, under a microscope, there's no intersex people in a pure scientific sense that you either have, I should have come prepared today to read it. Um, is it gonads? I need to look at this book to get it right if this is curious for you. But there is some sort of um, sexual distinction at the root that is not ambiguous in any person. And so that's what I said. I said there's really no intersex people. Um, the more I thought about it, and I was actually reviewing this book embodied by Preston Sprinkle, what I was reminded of is a scientific answer can technically be true and still sound harsh and be unloving. And so I want to amend that to say at a scientific level, um, intersex is exceedingly rare. Like, we're talking less than single percentages, and I think that Abigail wants to argue it down to, no, you could really do it. What Preston Sprinkle helped remind me of is, regardless of the science of it, there are some people that are born with both male and female genitalia. I talked to a converged pastor this week that, that counseled someone that had both male and female genitalia. And I don't think it would help that person to say, well, you're not actually intersex. Did you know the science of it? Look at what Abigail Favalli says. Again, it's helpful to know that, but um, I think, so when I see trans people, um, I'm going to answer that in two ways, because I don't know how the question asker means it. 
Let's talk about the person that my pastor friend told me that they were counseling. This is someone who, in every practical sense of the term, is intersex. Our culture would call intersex. Um, What I would say um, is in eternity, I expect that God will heal everything caused by the fall. And just as I said a couple of weeks ago, I believe same-sex attraction is a result of the fall. Um, I also believe that intersex conditions, again, using the pop term, not the scientific one, are a result of the fall. And in heaven, everything will be healed that is a result of the fall. So the, the uh, beautiful person that my pastor counseled, my pastor friend counseled, um, they will be either male or female in glory and not have both sets of genitalia. I believe that. I I, I wouldn't stake my entire life on that. I cannot chapter and verse you on that. But in eternity, the effects of the fall are reversed. Just like I believe that, like my friend David Bennett, will not experience same-sex attraction in eternity. I believe that Jesus will heal that. And again, I don't have a chapter and verse to say that will be healed. Um, But what I would say is, Uh, Scripture does tell us that everything sad comes untrue in heaven. Everything that's not in the way God intended it gets undone. And again, just to be super quick to say, just because we say something is a result of the fall doesn't mean that we're saying someone's morally culpable for it. I think this is where, like, I wouldn't want a trans person to hear this and hear, like, I'm saying, like, you're a result of the fall. It's, um, there's, there's actually a story, I believe, in the Gospel of John where they see a guy born blind, and Jesus' disciples are like, hey, who sinned, this fool or his parents? Because clearly the fall hit this brother straight upside the head. And Jesus is like, no dummies. Sorry, he didn't say that. It's not in the Greek. But he says, um, neither this man nor his parents sin, but he was born this way in order that God might be glorified. It's a lot like what the author of Genesis says at the end of, like, man, why did God allow um, Joseph's brothers to treat him so badly? He says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And I think that God has allowed people like David Bennett and like this um, trans person that my pastor friend was counseling to be born as they are in order that somehow God might gain greater glory through their life. I don't think the blind guy is still going to be blind in eternity. I don't think David Bennett is going to experience same-sex attraction in eternity. And so I would say I think that trans people uh, can look forward to the resurrection of their bodies just as much as we all can. I'm 36 and I already have some ailments. I'm looking forward to being resurrected and I would apply it to that. The last thing I will say is trans people might not mean though someone born that way. You know how Jesus said some are eunuchs born that way, others are made that way by men? A really interesting question is we're starting to see an entire generation that goes through an irreversible surgery uh, to try to change their body to match their sense of gender identity. And then there's a sense of grief and remorse like, oh my gosh, what have I done? This is something that no one in popular culture wants to talk about, but it's something I think we need to think about if we're truly compassionate. Are we really helping people if we're rushing them towards surgeries that we do not have longitudinal data would tell us, helps them. And that's, again, that's arguing in a secular mindset. The Bible certainly tells us it's not going to help you to denigrate your body. But so the question could be asked, what happens to a person who is born male, for example, that has their male parts cut off and has female parts put on? What I would say is, um, I believe that in some way their body will tell the redemption of Jesus Christ in eternity. I don't know what that'll look like. Do you know in eternity, Jesus still has his scars on his hand? It is possible a person who chose a trans identity and repented and wanted to follow Jesus in his gender for them, it is possible that they will live with those scars into eternity to say, look, he brought me in. It is also possible Jesus will graciously give them a new body and they can still say with their words, he brought me in. I do not know or have any indication because scripture doesn't tell us, but what scripture does tell us is eunuchs, again, according to Jesus, people who are born without working sexual organs or have someone cut them off will be in heaven. So being trans is not disqualifying to being in heaven and they will have a glory in heaven that far outshines even folks that had lots of kids. So I don't know what their bodies will look like, but I know it'll be glorious. And in some way, it will be like Jesus's glorious body. And so that's what I think will be in heaven. Next question. 
Is there a third response? Okay, I think this is a follow-up. Let's see. Is there a third response? At the women's conference, Jackie Hill Perry gave her testimony. She was a lesbian and came to the conclusion that she could not love her girlfriend and Jesus at the same time. She moved away and studied the Bible in depth and fellowshiped with believers. She is married now to her husband and has children, and she is serving God. In view of Romans 1, 18 to 32 and 1 Corinthians 6, could this be a heaven or hell issue? And if yes, shouldn't we only be trying to lovingly persuade our LGBTQ friends to go the route Jackie Hill Perry did? Um, let me take this in pieces. Um, Jackie Hill Perry's testimony is incredible. She's written a great book. I think it's called Gay Girl, Good God. And she talks about how her identity went from calling herself a gay girl to now she's like, I believe in a good God. And she does not use the term gay. That is not how she thinks of herself. God has worked mightily in her life. I want to honor Jackie Hill Perry. Um, let me look at the questions here. So um, I am not familiar with um, whether Jackie Hill Perry has experienced a change in sexual orientation. I'm not aware. I haven't read her book. Um, I know that, like, if she did, I, uh, it could be that she is the 0.1% of people, according to the ex-head of Exodus International, or the 15 people, according to Mark Yornhurst's longitudinal study, which, by the way, links in your worship guide to both of those. She could be one of the exceedingly rare humans that finds orientation change in this life. I don't know. I think someone's shaking their head at me, so maybe that's not it. So then it could be that she's living in what I call the mixed orientation marriage in the sermon. And I don't know if she uses that term. Again, people can get funny about terms. What a mixed orientation marriage is, I don't know if this is what Jackie Hill Perry has. It's where um, one or both partners are um, attracted to the same sex, but they choose to marry the opposite sex in obedience to Jesus's command from scripture. So to just give you an example, it could be a gay man and a lesbian woman choose to marry each other because they want to be married in obedience to Jesus's teaching on marriage. That would be a mixed orientation marriage. It would also be a mixed orientation marriage if a gay man married a straight woman. Um, there are difficulties that come with the mixed orientation marriage, just as there are difficulties with celibacy. There is no easy path in this life where we will all experience sexual brokenness. And so it's possible that Jackie Hill Perry is doing that, where she's saying, hey, my personal infatuations aren't everything. I want to be married. I want to have kids. What I would say about Jackie Hill Perry is I think she shows a great option of Christian faithfulness, whether that's orientation change or a mixed orientation marriage. She's a great uh, example of Christian faithfulness to look to on this topic. I would just say um, her story, in my experience, is exceedingly rare, and so I wouldn't want to lift her high as the norm um, because most, again, 85 or 99 percent of people, depending on what number you want to use, do not experience any orientation change in this life. And it's similar to like um, I know a guy that got saved and never touched alcohol again. Raging drunk, never touched again. I'm like, praise his name, Jesus did that for you. A lot of people have to war with that slowly over life, and I don't want to sell them a bill of goods that this could be you if you were just serious about Jesus. We've got to find a way to honor the heroes of our faith and say everyone's journey to Jesus is different. So I think Jackie Hill Perry is awesome. Uh, to get to the second part of the question, in view of Romans 1, 18 to 32, and 1 Corinthians 6, could this be a heaven or hell issue? Um... If by this we mean practicing same-sex uh, uh, same behavior. So a man who is having sex with a man and a woman who is having sex with a woman. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, I believe the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me read this to make sure to get it just right. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Okay, uh, verse 9. Uh, so this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. So I'm processing with you in the moment here, uh, asking God for wisdom. Let's read his word. This is where wisdom begins. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So good news, he, he feels like they're going to be okay. What I would say is, yeah, Paul's saying if you do not repent of these sins and love these sins more than Jesus, you're not going to be in heaven. And it's not because the sin is so bad. It's sin isn't the issue. Unrepentance is. And so if you are unrepentingly idolatrous of your sports team, you're not going to be in heaven, according to Jesus. Or excuse me, Paul. If you are unrepenting of your greed, you will not be in heaven. If you are unrepenting of having sex with someone of the same sex, that's what that word means there, men who practice homosexuality, it's a man who sleeps with another man. You will not be in heaven. I think the call of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is let's repent of our sin, let's seek to follow Jesus, and let's ask the Holy Spirit for mercy to follow Jesus. And so, um, yeah, at a very strict level, if you don't repent of your homosexuality, uh, homosexual practice, I do think that's a heaven or hell issue, just like not repenting of your greed is a, a heaven or hell issue. Um, but I, I think we also have to recognize for people who do repent, sometimes it takes time to walk alongside of them the journey of repentance. And again, we don't want to crush a person who is new in the faith and it needs to be gently walked along. Paul says this in First Thessalonians, I believe it's chapter 2. He said, we were like a mother uh, hen with you, I think. That we were gentle with you. We didn't beat you over the head with your sin. We walked alongside of you kindly and brought you along slowly because it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance, uh, not, um, not our condemnation. So you could tell I don't, I don't want to make the black and white statement having sex with someone of the same sex is a heaven and hell issue because then I would have to say being greedy is a heaven and hell issue, according to Paul. It's all semantically together in that sentence. I would submit sin is not the issue, repentance is. And that's why I said, if I'm talking to a gay person, I'm not concerned about who they're sleeping with. I'm concerned about what they believe about Jesus because they probably also have greed in their life and swindling in their life, just like most Americans do, just like I do, that we need to deal with one step at a time. And what I want to become careful of is sometimes we make homosexuality the one sin that if we even sniff it in your life, it's like, well, then you're going to hell. And it's like, if we treated greed that way, oh my gosh, every American Christian would probably burn. That's not the gospel. The gospel is God is gracious. He washes us, he covers us, and he brings us along um, as we keep coming back in confession and repentance to him. So yeah, uh, uh, repent, sin is not the issue, repentance is. I want to read you a quote from David Bennett's book on this same thing, because I think maybe the real question here is, can you be a Christian who believes same-sex marriage is okay and go to heaven? I think that's a, let me add that question. If you weren't asking it, question asker, we'll make this Chad's question. Is believing Jesus' teaching on marriage a heaven or hell issue? I would say no. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, is what Romans chapter 10 tells us. Anyone who genuinely has faith in Jesus, I think, can be saved no matter how mistaken, dangerous, bad, or stupid their theology is. I told you a couple of weeks ago, I don't think same-sex marriage is an open-handed issue that Christians are free to disagree on. I think the Bible is abundantly clear. So let me say that again. The Bible is abundantly clear. The Bible is also abundantly clear that God is Trinity, that he has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do I think you can go to heaven if you don't believe in the Trinity? Yes, which would make you technically a heretic for not believing in the Trinity. If you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you say, Jesus, I trust you to save me, and your theology sucks, I think you can go to heaven. You're just going to limp and stumble the whole way there. Because remember Titus chapter 1, it's our knowledge of the truth that accords with godliness, that leads to godliness. So we want to get good theology so we can walk with Jesus. Good. I just don't ever think we should make our theology a heaven or hell issue. Heaven or hell comes down to this one issue. This, the Reformation was literally fought over this. We are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone, um, to the glory of God alone. And we know this because scripture alone is our ultimate authority. 
As long as you clear those bars, you can be saved from the Reformation perspective that we hold here. And so um, if you have faith in Jesus, even if you're being obstinate, I don't think that means you're going to hell. I think that means you're in danger and you should check yourself. And uh, the way James would say it is, uh, you show me your faith apart from your works, I'll show you your faith by your works. Meaning, um, so you're not going to get me to say if a person is sleeping with someone of the same sex, they're going to hell. I will say they are wrong, they're in a danger zone, they're in a bad spot, and I'm going to plead with them the kindness of Christ and to teach them. But man, if they pass away and I don't have the chance to know where they changed their mind, I'm not going to tell you they're in hell because they didn't repent of that. Because God knows the heart, and if their heart genuinely trusted Jesus and their mind was just warped by some dumb false teacher who tricked them and tickled their tickling ears. I think that false teacher is going to hell, not the person. Um, let me conclude by saying this. I know this is a messy answer. It'd be so much easier to say yes or no. I just think the gospel is so big that it's not easy to say no on stuff like this. If you genuinely trust in Jesus, you'll be in heaven no matter how bad your theology, no matter how immoral you are. But if you genuinely love Jesus, you're going to want to try to follow him. Let me close this question with a quote from David Bennett, because this is the debate, faith and works. How does it all work together? I think he captures this so well. He says, our entry, he's talking about this question, can you um, uh, believe in same-sex marriage and go to heaven? And he basically says in the book, you can, you're just going to have a bad time here and like, you might not get to heaven because you might deceive yourself because maybe you never believe. Like, it's a very dangerous spot to be, is what he says. Listen, let me just quote him. I've said like three times I'll quote him. This is on page 235. He says, Our entry into the kingdom of heaven is through faith. But without faith, faith without works is dead. One day God's judgment of each of us will reveal whether our faith was genuine. God calls us to demonstrate our faith now through his enabling power by changing our minds, that's repenting, turning from our own way and giving up everything to follow him. So all this to be said, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through the finished work of Christ alone. If you really believe in Jesus, you will be in heaven, no matter how bad your theology or how immoral your life. And if you really believe in Jesus, in the words of David Bennett, then you want to demonstrate that belief through repentance, through turning from your own way and giving up everything to follow him. And what I would say is, and I've counseled someone on this issue and on other issues. If you would ever say in your heart, I know Jesus says that, but I don't care. I am worried for your soul at that point. Because that hardness of heart is the kind of thing I think sends a person to hell. I know Jesus says that, but I don't care. And so I want to be real serious if that is... Uh, case. Okay, um, next question. Uh, there is a sinful side of this subject that wasn't covered within this series. Society has taken the subject to an extreme. Chemical castration, mutilation, an elementary school curriculum dictated at, uh, directed at very young children. Please share your thoughts. Um, I agree that society has taken the sexual revolution to an extreme. Uh, I agree that chemical castration is not God's heart for children. And again, I don't think you even need to be a Christian to recognize that. We don't have longitudinal studies. This is my talking point outside of the church for someone that doesn't recognize the authority of the Bible. We don't have longitudinal studies that says this does anything helpful. Um, mutilation, elementary school directed at very young children. I think what I would say is, yeah, I agree. Our society is crazy. It's like, I would say it this way. Here's how the Bible says it. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Um, I'm not sure what to, to add beyond that, but I guess what I would add is greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so, like, for example, my children go to public school. I'm not saying your kids should. I'm saying this is a personal choice our family has made. We make it every year in discussion with Jesus. God bless you if you come to a different conclusion. Is a dad... 
I am very concerned about the things my children are being taught on sex and gender in school. So I, I think I feel you, question asker. I think we can have one of a couple of responses. Um, we can, there's, oh, there's a book by a pastor. It's called A Strategic Retreat. Let me look it up real quick. Treat book. Uh, there's a book called Strategic Retreat. No, How to Run a Planning Retreat. Uh, I can look it up later. There's a pastor who's written a book that says basically it's a job of Jesus-loving Christians to get away from big liberal cities and to build little communities that love Jesus. I would say that's a legitimate option. There's also that book, The Benedict Option, that lifts that high. If God calls you to that, God bless you. I think we need people doing that. Um, the book of Daniel also says that God allowed his people to be carried away in exile so that they could shine like the stars above uh, in the darkness of Babylon. And so I would say we, it, it's up to all of us to say, Jesus, what are you calling me to do? Are you calling me to be a light in Babylon like Daniel? Or are you calling me to retreat, to build a community um, outside that as long as you're not crusty and angry with the culture, but you're trying to honor Jesus like a Benedict option, um, like the, uh, the Qumran community, is that's what they're called, where we have the Dead Sea Scrolls from them? As long as you're doing it in a godly way, they're all good options. But I'm rambling here. I totally agree. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I just, to me, that compels me to want to be in it. But I'll be real with you. The second that it feels like it's not good for my kids, I'm pulling my kids out of that. And so right now, Karen and I are blessed to have the opportunity that Karen's in the classroom a lot. We know what's being said. And we are doing double duty on teaching at home to have to undo some of the nonsense our kids are being taught to teach them a biblical ethic. But I will also say, some of what came up in this series, I know it said some of this wasn't covered in the sermon series. What I would say is, when my kids get old enough, I'm teaching them the reason that a gender spectrum is wrong is not just because we're made male and female, but because that view of your body, like we said last week, doesn't take seriously your embodied person that God gave you. And so we're trying to teach them whys behind the answer. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm rambling now. Question asker, I agree with you. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Greater is he who is in the world. Jesus comes soon. Um, next question. You mentioned some people choosing to enter a mixed marriage orientation, or excuse me, a mixed orientation marriage as a way to rightly experience a sexual relation in this life. Is this union only to address sexual desire? If so... The purpose of marriage has been reduced to nothing more than a way to fulfill the desires of the flesh. I totally re resonate with what you're saying, question asker. It kind of sounds like 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9 to me. Let me read this again. To the unmarried and to the widows, I say it's good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better for them to marry than to burn with passion. I agree. I don't think that's the most romantic. There's a reason I didn't use that verse to teach God's heart for marriage. But I think what scripture does is scripture recognizes God has an ideal. That marriage should be about more than sex. Where we fall short of the ideal, God is gracious to us. So I mentioned divorce earlier. Let me say I come from a divorced home and I have no room for those that would not be uh, gracious to someone that has experienced divorce because I know it is sometimes the last option you want, but it's the only option for safety. Um, when it comes to that, Jesus says the reason that Moses gave you the commands for divorce, it's because your hearts were hard. You couldn't receive what God told you. Your hearts were so hard, you were sinning so badly against one another. Yes, this isn't quite God's heart for you to divorce, but it's better than letting that nonsense go on. I think that's kind of the spirit Paul's channeling here. Like God's heart for marriage is this, but if you are so hard in your heart and so inflamed with passion, just go ahead and get married. It's not the ideal, but do it. I think he's kind of giving a similar pastoral wisdom to Jesus there. But I will also say this about mixed orientation marriage. And I got to be really, really honest with you. I first heard the term mixed orientation marriage a year ago, and I, I have to confess, I'm not proud of this. I thought that's really weird. Um, I was talking about this with Karen, and Karen's like, well, I wasn't attracted to you when I first met you. I was like, thanks, dear. <laughs> that, that, that's not like saying she was attracted to girls. She was just like, I was not the particular boy she was attracted to of all the boys that are out there. And I think what a mixed orientation marriage has an opportunity to do is to say, 
yes, it could be in some cases about just burning with lust. And I would say if you're going to get married to burn with lust, like praise God you're being so honest about it, but let's work on that because I don't think that's great. I, I, I think question asker is right here to talk about, it does sound kind of fleshy, but I think God's gracious and condescends to you in your flesh. So I would say let's work on it. But think about it this way. A mixed orientation marriage is two people saying, I will never feel excited about having sex with you. Or at least I think I will never feel excited about having sex with you. But I think marriage is about something so much more than sex. Maybe it's to have kids. And I want to be fruitful and multiply with you. And so a mixed orientation marriage, it could be kind of shady. Just like I know straight couples, they get married for shady reasons. And I'm like, you shouldn't get married. You could get married for bad reasons as a straight person or a mixed orientation marriage. You could also get married for good reasons as a straight person or a mixed orientation marriage. And if someone said, like, everyone in my family line has died out, I want my name to continue on. I want to have children. And I know the only way I can do that with Jesus' blessing is through a marriage to someone of the opposite sex. I think they might have a view, higher view of marriage than some straight married people that just got married because they were burning with passion. So I guess I would just tease out that level of nuance. Yes, it could be a fleshy thing, but it could be quite a God-honoring thing. Um, I don't think we should ever pass judgment on what someone's doing as long as they're following what Jesus says, as long as they're taking one of those two options that are available. But I, I do think what I would want to say is, have you considered celibacy? If they've considered it and processed it, God bless you, follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. But if they won't even consider it, I would consider that a discipleship opportunity. Um, and I, again, I would say the same for a straight couple. Okay. After you decided to cancel the David Bennett event, it felt like you were mad at us and wanted to teach us a lesson. Uh, what was your motivation for walking us through the Bible on human sexuality? Um, let me start by saying, I'm sorry it felt that way. This is going to sound like such a parent line. I wasn't mad. I was disappointed. Um, but before I explain that, let me just say, like, I'm also an imperfect human, and I'm unaware of my own heart. And if I had frustrations that I'm not aware of and those come through, I'm sorry. You shouldn't be getting that from your pastor. Um, 2 Timothy um, uh, chapter 2 I believe it is, uh, says to teach the word um, to, uh, with all authority, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and teaching. First half of that verse has always come very natural to me. I have a backbone. It's not hard for me to teach, to prove, reprove, to rebuke. Having patience in my teaching is something I am still learning. So where that came through that I am still an imperfect man learning to be more patient, I am sorry. Please do not take any frustration you got from me as reflective of God's heart for you. I do not believe God is disappointed or uh, uh, frustrated with any of you, uh, anyone in Christ anyway. Um, that said, I think... The reason I wanted to teach through this series is I was disappointed, and here's what I was disappointed at. Um, I got people saying things were unbiblical that weren't unbiblical. And so, um, like, some of the concern, like, let me say this in hindsight, knowing what I know about our church now, I don't think David Bennett was the right person to invite to our church. I love him. I think he's awesome. This book I want to put in the hands of all of my gay friends. He is, um, I would say, probably best equipped to work with those outside of the church. Kind of like Paul was best equipped to work with the Gentiles, and Peter was best equipped to work with the Jews. Um, to go back, if you were here the week we went through Acts 15, and I said, hey, he says don't put the burden on him. He also says don't drink, eat food with blood in it, because that's going to like freak all the Jewish people out. I think in hindsight, the critique that was valid is that David Bennett putting a rainbow flag on his book and calling himself like hashtag fabulous to glorious was probably like drinking the blood in front of our church. And so if I could go back and do it again, I would have invited someone like Sam Alberian, who says almost all of the same things with slightly different terminology, but he presents himself in a way that's not as shocking to people who have been in church their whole life. 
I actually think David's better at talking to people outside the church than Sam is, but I brought this person into our church. And so, again, while I still believe that David Bennett is biblical and that his stance is right, I think from a wisdom standpoint, having nothing to do with David and just knowing our church, I should have known our church better. So that's where I'm just disappointed in me. I'll start there. Um, If the critique was simply that, that Chad, I know what he's saying isn't unbiblical, but it's kind of shocking to my sensibilities. I think we would have canceled the event and moved on. But what was said was not, it's unbiblical, it's shocking to my sensibilities. What's said is, um, or excuse me, what was said was not, it's shocking to my sensibilities, even though I recognize he's within biblical tradition. What was said is, he's wrong, he's unbiblical. And that's what got my attention. Before God, as much as I've studied this, David Bennett isn't saying anything unbiblical. He is saying things that maybe aren't wise in every setting, especially for a church in suburbia like us. And if you start calling that unbiblical, my concern is the only way you could say that is with the surface level understanding of scripture. And I don't say that to offend anybody. I say that to say as a pastor, my real concern, this is going to shock you, I don't want to see churches in this valley throw their Bibles in the trash, leave the resurrected Jesus behind, and go affirming. But that's the trajectory I'm seeing. When one generation has an answer that is technically accurate, marriage is between a man and a woman, but cannot articulate the why behind that or where that's going, the next generation will throw off the shallow answer. I've seen this play out too many times. So why did I preach this sermon series? The most fundamental reason is to be a stalwart against churches compromising on a biblical faith. And I think I said this week one of the series, there's a lot of Christians that technically know the right answers, that haven't thought deeply about it. Culture is forcing us to think deeply about it. I had one converged pastor say, everything I'm saying in this series is too nuanced for an average Christian to grab a hold of. And I could feel that. Even some of what I'm saying today, I'm like, this has been months of study. I feel like it would take us many cups of coffee to get there. But I told this pastor, I said, we at least have to try because if our culture is going this way, we've got to learn the nuance. And I'm sorry, I'm rambling now. My motivation in teaching this series was I want us to have a more robust view of what the Bible says so that we can know not just what we believe, but why we believe it. Because if you have a why, you're not going to go the affirming route. But if you don't have a why, you might not go the affirming route, but your kids will. And I've seen it too many times, and that's the primary reason I did this. Again, to any degree my personality has come out, and I'm sure it has, I apologize, that's inappropriate, that's on me. Please forgive me as someone that's still learning how to do this pastoring thing. Um, I probably haven't said as much as I meant to. I know I said it a couple times in the series. I love you. I love getting to be your pastor. And um, it is an honor to get to do that. And to any degree anything in this series made you feel differently. I'm sorry. That's my flesh that needs to be dealt with in the power of the Spirit. Okay, Uh, next question. I have a 12-year-old boy. If he approached you with questions he has heard from friends at school which make him doubt his gender, how would you respond to him? Um, If we had a boy, a 12-year-old boy that came up and asked me, um, like, like, if he's doubting his gender, it's basically, I think I'm a girl. Honestly, my first response would probably be like you heard in the sermon last week. I would ask him, what makes you think that? And, and so I can't totally tell you, game this out for you, because it really depends on what he says. But if it's like, oh, I don't grow good facial hair like my buddies. May, maybe I am a girl. Like, I, I'd pull aside my story, and I'm like, neither do I. I'd try to engage at that level. But there, there's a thousand things it could be. Let me say this. I would start with questions. Not, I, I, to be totally honest with you, I would not start with, well, you are a boy, so don't be proud. Receive that. I would, I believe all that's true. I wouldn't lead with that. I would lead with questions and ask to try to understand their experience. Now, here's where I'm ultimately going with this. And again, I can't tell you exactly what it would look like, but I think 
This may help you breathe a sigh of relief. My ultimate goal in pastorally counseling anyone struggling with gender dysphoria, having any questions about their gender, is to help them receive their created body as a gift from God and to help them see discipleship to Jesus as a path of learning to live into the um, body you have been given. That is the ultimate goal of Christian discipleship. It is to see ourselves as united, integrated people. Not to separate out sex and gender, but to say when God gave you this sex body, he did it because he thought up a gender for you. And I would want to help that young boy go through a path of learning to receive his body as a gift from Jesus. To, to not be denigrated. Um, so, so hopefully, like, I am clear on that. It's not like I'd be like, recommending puberty blockers while he figures it out. But I probably would go with more questions um, than statements early on. So that's where I would go on that. Again, if there's any follow-up, send them in. I've got two more for now. Um, I know two male homosexuals. Could you give us some examples of how you would teach us to talk with them? How to get them to open their ears to hear the gospel of Jesus could be good news to them. Um... I love this question. I think what I would start with is, um, as I look at Jesus in Scripture, one of the things he's described as is a friend of sinners. That he receives sinners and eats with them. And so, I, like me and Karen, our strategy in our life, we have two male friends who are married to each other. And we deeply love these friends. And they are a part of our lives. Our kids know them, like really know them, are familiar with them. Like call them uncle by their name, like they're that cherished in our family. And so I can only tell you, my, our strategy has been to try to be like Jesus, to, to open up our home and to invite people in and to... Um, Seek to love them over long meals together and just get to know their life and get to ask questions. And one of the questions I asked David Bennett is I said, um, it's kind of awkward that they haven't asked me what I think about sex and marriage yet. Because like, I'm a pastor. They know, right? Now, I was going to invite my friends to the David Bennett event. That was kind of like my whole, like, I was getting ready to do that. And, and okay, that's fine that that's not happening. Um, but what David said, uh, David Bennett said to me, I thought this was so good. He said, um, he talked about there is a threshold of faith someone has to reach before you can have certain conversations. And this doesn't have to do with homosexuality. This is any discipleship conversation. The reality is you will see sin in another person's life a mile before they see it, because this is how life works. This is why God puts us in community, because we can help each other. But you have to let someone get to that threshold of faith before you address it. Otherwise, you will crush them. And so, um, you know, when Scripture says, like, a bruised reed, Jesus the Messiah will not break. He'll be gentle. When Paul says, we're like a nursing hen among you. I think what I would say is, if you have gay friends in your life, um, a great way to share the good news of Jesus is to, like Jesus, have long meals with them and to ask them good questions and to love them well and to build the kind of relationship through which they should be asking you, okay, I know you're a Christian. What do you think about this? And honestly, with our two friends that we love dearly, it's felt like it's going on too long. So I was ready to do the whole event thing with them. I do have to say, and maybe you'll think this is a cop-out, because I'm a pastor, I feel like I have to go extra slow with people because people are already on guard with me as a pastor. They're not on guard with you. Um, but yeah, what I would say is to seek to love them well, to spend time. And I would say, talk to them about Jesus. Don't talk to them about their sex life. If they want to follow Jesus, then by all means. Um, but so, so what I've done is I've asked them, what is your experience with church like? And I've heard their church hurt. And I've said, I'm sorry. Um, you know, uh, I might encourage you to give them the book of war of love you should probably read it first to make sure you agree with it i agree with it doesn't mean you will but um if you give them this i'm going to give this to my two friends 
because it's mostly autobiographical where he tells the story of how he was a gay guy so committed on this and now he loves Jesus and it's so much better. Um, I think what I would say is if you have gay friends in your life, have them into your home because they won't hear truth from you until they feel your compassion. That's the model of Jesus. Build a relationship with them. And then as you can, have an intentionality to always try to take the relationship one step further to tell them more about Jesus. So the last time I had dinner with my gay friends, it was like, Karen and I even game planned it before. It was like, hey, um, tonight I'm going to ask them what their experience with church has been like. Next time they come over, they're getting this book from me. And I, I think that's going to be the end to share it. But again, I would say talk to them about Jesus and how much you love Jesus. And if you ever get pressed, like, what do you think about our life? Again, maybe you'll think this is a cop out. I asked David what he would say. I thought there was a lot of wisdom in this. He said, um, what he would say is, hey, as a follower of Jesus, I believe some different things about marriage than you probably do. And so if I were gay, I would probably do things differently than you. Like I... I would not get married because I think marriage is ultimately about this picture about Jesus and the church, and there's something more there. But again, like if, if you don't know Jesus, that probably sounds like voodoo to you. That, that's how I would encourage you to talk to your um, gay friends. Real practical thing you could do, uh, question asker, is in light of this sermon series, you could ask your gay friends this. And this is how I've gone deeper with some of my gay friends. Um, I, I shared the story with my friend Glenn in a sermon a few years ago. The reason I got to know that is I heard like all these gay people had had bad experiences with church and I, I'm straight. I've never, I, I, I was unaware of it. And so I went to my friend Glenn and I said, Glenn, I've heard gay people have had bad experience with church. Have you ever had anyone do something sketch to you? And he shared it all with me. And so you could, if for the gay friends in your life, you could tell them, hey, our church has been talking about this for a few weeks, and, and our pastor says the church has been so harsh on gay people, and I just, I've never lived that. Could you tell me your experience with the church? Could be a great way you could get into a faith-based conversation. So to review, build the relationship, get to a threshold of faith first, and um, again, don't just hang out with them. Have intentionality to try to move them down the line. And one way you could possibly move them down the line uh, is by bringing up this sermon series. Seriously, use providence to say, my pastor's really off on this thing here. And not, not off like wrong, but like he's really going off on it. You, you tell me about your experience. Um, I, I would encourage you to not waste this opportunity to do that before it's gone. Um, again, you might think, I tell them they're going to lose the relationship. That's my fear. This book cured me of that fear, fear. Last thing to say, this book, Us Versus Us, has really messed with me. This book, Us Versus Us, is um, the largest, it's the results of the largest study ever done on um, LGBTQ people and the church. Um, and... Oh my goodness, I need to pull the stat in here. It's just pure statistics of talking to people. And it says in here something to the effect of, oh, come on, I know I starred this. Ah, here we go. 86% of LGBTQ people were raised in the faith community from ages 0 to 18. 86%. So your friends probably grew up in church. Now, here is the stat that blew my mind. I'm sorry this is taking me so long. I should have written this down in advance. Only 3% of LGBTQ people said they left because of the church's beliefs around marriage and sex. Only 3%. The rest left for a variety of reasons, but the most popular was based on how they were treated. So like my great fear is like, man, the second I tell them what I believe, they're going to run away. The data would say LGBTQ people are more open to hearing this stuff than we might think if we lead with the right heart. That blew me away. Okay, uh, number four, my daughter is lesbian, which is hard for me to accept because I love her so much. I think God shares that heart. Uh, she grew up knowing Jesus, but has since turned away. Man. Um, how can you help me as a dad to deal with this? Do you have any ideas on how I should talk to my daughter? If 
feel like the Holy Spirit's saying I've already shared most of what would be helpful. Let me just review a couple of things. I would have Jesus-based conversations with your daughter, not um, LGBTQ-based conversations, insofar as that is possible with her. Um, again, I, I don't think sin is the issue. I think repentance is. And so I think, and again, you can use this sermon series with your daughter. I know it's tender. I would say to the degree that you feel it possible, you could say, hey, we've been talking about LGBTQ people and just how much Jesus loves you. And I don't know how many conversations you've had. If you've had a lot of conversations, it could be, hey, I know I've told you this is so hard for me, but I'm also seeing that God loves you. And I just, I want to help you see that better. Honey, is there anything I could do to help you know how much God loves you? Like, what, what could I do to help you know that? I, I would encourage you to start there. Um, and I would really only worry about anything regarding sexuality um, on the other side of following Jesus. Again, I don't mean to make this a be-all, get-all. I would say get this book and read it so you know what you're recommending. But if it were me, I might give her this book and say, sweetie, I know, I, I remember when you followed Jesus and I, I know maybe you feel like there's not a place following Jesus for you. Here's the story of a, this is where you could say a gay Christian, even if you're like, I wouldn't use that term in the church, but this is like the Sam Albury moment to use it. Say, here's the moment of a guy who's gay, or if, if that hurts your conscience, say, don't say it. Say, here's a same-sex attracted Christian. And I just, I wonder if what he's discovered might be compelling to you. Um, I know it's got to be so hard. Like, I feel that when you say it's hard for me to accept. I totally, totally get that. And we live in a culture that wants to bash you over the head and make you feel a fool for that. And I think the Bible says the reason that's hard for you to accept as a parent is because that's not God's ultimate heart and you are sharing God's heart for your daughter. There is nothing wrong with you having a hard time doing that. What I would say is you've got to learn to like Jesus say, I know this is hard for me, but I'm not going to keep bringing that up for you. And I, I know this is the, the, the real tension, but it's like, I would ask Jesus for the strength to say, Jesus, you love me even when I am running far from you. Would you help me do that with my daughter where it's very difficult here? You know what it's like to have a wayward son. Or daughter, would you help me do that with my daughter? Again, like, I, I want to both say I get that it's hard and I think I would struggle in the exact same ways you are. But I also think that if we're going to image Jesus, that means that we take the struggle into our own body and we deal with it and we get uncomfortable for the sake of love. And I, I think you're trying to do that. So I would just say keep doing that. I think you're doing a good job. And I am here to help in any degree I can. Again, last thought, use this sermon series as a launching point in. And again, the cool thing is you don't have to agree with everything your pastor said. You could say, eh, it's kind of hit or miss. This week was good. This week wasn't. But like, you know, like I, you're not trashing on me to say that to your daughter. Okay, this is the last question I have. So if you have one, you got to get it in uh, while I'm answering this. Um, how would you respond if a member of the LGBTQIA asked you to be a part of their wedding, whether it be serving or part of the wedding party. Um, let me take this in two parts. If they're asking me and my capacity as a pastor, um, I would tell them, and this has happened, this isn't hypothetical. We had a young lesbian couple come to Fair Oaks one week and they loved it so much. I think they were loved really well by our community. We went to lunch after with several people kind of from our pew over there. And then they said, we love it so much. Could you do our premarital counseling? And I thought, oh God. I didn't want to have this conversation one week into their time at Fair Oaks. And so, you know, honestly, I was kind of surprised because we say on our website what we believe, but I, I think it wasn't totally clear back then. We've, we've made it clearer now. But anyway, um, what I told them was, hey, I love you. I am for you. And you are welcome here. I also, this might make you uncomfortable, but I'll just be real with you. I feel the Lord leading me to share this. I said, I can see that the love you have is real. And I'm sure Christians have probably delegitimized the thing you have. And I don't want you to hear me delegitimizing what you have in any way. I see a real sacredness in the way you treat each other. 
Um, I also believe that what Jesus says about marriage is it's more than a commitment between two people, but it's actually telling us something of God and his love for us. And the way that the shape of that love is supposed to look, it can't work without harmony, without a distinction in gender. And so I love you. I'm not trying to delegitimize or take away from what you have, but our view of marriage here would be that marriage is something different than what you're experiencing here. And so while you're welcome here anytime, I cannot do your premarital or perform your wedding because our beliefs about marriage are it's about something more. That was as compassionate as I can do it. And maybe some of you are like, that was too compassionate. They left. Kind of angry. Which was really hard for me. And I've spent a lot of time talking to the Lord about those two women. And I'm just praying. It's like for as much as that broke me a little bit two years ago, it felt like God put me back together meeting David. And so, I, man, I'm, I'm just praying that God would grant us the grace to see encounters like David Bennett, not just like the other one. Um, that said, so that's me. You're probably not even asking about me, question asker. You're probably asking for yourself. Like if you, a human, a Christian, not in the capacity of a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, but as a Jesus-loving Christian, are asked to take part in a wedding party, um, I would say this is a matter of conscience. Um, again, given what marriage is, let me tell you where my conscience is at. I would not be in a person's wedding party. Because in my view of things, if you are in the wedding party, you are participating in the ceremony. And my conscience is I cannot participate in something that's telling a different story than what I believe about marriage. So I would not be in that wedding party. I would probably encourage you to think long and hard before you agree to being in that wedding party. But I wouldn't say you can't. I would just say, I don't know. Um, to make this one even harder. So, so that's what I would say. The harder version of this question is, should I attend a gay wedding? I don't know why I make this harder on myself. Um, there's no way to answer this that doesn't end with me getting in trouble with somebody. Um, let me say this. Should you attend the wedding or not is a matter of conscience. It would be easier if I would say no. I, I know that. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons not to go. But what I would say is I can conceive of a scenario in which if I were not a pastor and someone important to me asked me to go to their wedding and they knew what I believed about marriage. I'm not talking like I'm sending them mixed signals. They know. Like I had that conversation like I did with a couple of years ago. I need to edit that out, but a couple of years ago. Um, if they know what I believe about marriage and they know I believe this ain't it, I might go to the wedding out of love for them and I dang sure would send a gift to say, I love you. I want to be a part of your life. You know I believe marriage is this thing over here and I'll keep talking to you about that as long as I have breath because I think Jesus is awesome. But I'm talking in hypotheticals. I don't even know. I just want to say I could conceive of a lane. I do not think that should be your default, and I do not place that as a burden on anyone. If, if I, I would say this. You need to pray about it before you answer yes or no. And whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, I think you need to obey the voice of the Spirit. Not try to be like your friend Chad. Um, and, and I know that's not an answer that's going to please everybody. I know there's a lot of people who would say that you can't go. I just, Jesus was in a lot of settings where the religious people of his day said, you can't go. 
and he went anyway for the sake of love. And again, I'm not saying that means you should go. I'm saying we've got to have a category for it and to prayerfully think it through with Jesus. But if they don't know what you believe about marriage, it is dangerous for you to go. If you are participating in the ceremony in any way, I, I would strongly caution against that. Um, but man, yeah. Anything else is just going to make this harder. So I'll leave it at that. It's a matter of conscience, and you should ask Jesus about it, and you should do whatever Jesus says and not bow to the peer pressure of our culture or to the church. You should bow to Jesus. And with that said, that is all of the questions I have. Let me close this in prayer here. Jesus, I... Uh, I feel particularly on this last question, like maybe we're just swirling around having regrets going, oh man, maybe I did it wrong in the past. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I just, that, that's where my mind's going. So to any degree that that's happening in anyone right now, I pray that you would just send your Holy Spirit to calm our hearts. Jesus, I pray more than reviewing the past in our minds, you would get our eyes up onto you and we would relax into your love and that your love and your teaching would guide us into a future that is better than our past. Lord, don't let anyone here leave feeling condemned today because of making any wrong choices. Help us to remember that if we confess our sins, if we're not even sure it's a sin, but we say, Jesus, I don't know if I should have done that, but I want to honor you. Help me do that. You are faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness and cleanse us. God, I know if we believe that, it's not going to make us flippant about sin, but it's going to make us, like David Bennett said, more eager to walk in faith. And so would you do that gospel work in us to make us more eager to walk in faith? Um, help us not be so worried about where the line is that we forget where you are. Lead us in the way of peace. In your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Thank you for sticking around, everybody.